So the space solar and orbital industry track. So our premise going into this was that uh, there is an there is a potential alliance between these two grand goals, and we wanted to look at it from the point of view of the interstellar community being the customer of why should you care. So basically, we started in uh, if I can figure this out um, that space solar power would be enabling to interstellar travel. And how, could we characterize how? Could we tell you how good that would be for your goals? And then that in-space power beaming and beam propulsion would be enabling to interstellar travel, and that there could be national goals that would forward both ambitious programs. There might be a critical path on the way to, to both. And we thought that if we could characterize them, the model that might be cool to use is the decadal study, which is kind of the example of how you do community-wide uh, priority setting. I am unable to figure out which way is forward and back here. Okay. Oh, left and right. Okay. So, you know, obviously there are sort of three classes that we considered. We considered at the at the low end the sort of star wisp beam propulsion. Then we thought about the beam uh, the uh, pulsed fusion dataless, and then we thought about the world ship and how could the applications of power beaming enable those. So. All of the things that an interstellar advocate wants to do uh, require big mass, big energy, and big dollars. And that's a problem, particularly because your steady state funding for curiosity type of missions, all of NASA's budget, is at about 0.008% of GDP. Not a federal budget, of the total GDP. So could you get somebody else to build your supporting industrial base infrastructure on their dollar? So there's this wonderful big opportunity right now where fossil fuels are causing us problems. We have to build a lot more power. We have to figure out how we switch over. And, and for you guys, since energy choices are only partially economic and are part political advocacy and social values, the question for you as interstellar people is, is it worth your time to be politically active in SSP? Does it forward your agenda? And I'm going to show you why our guys think it does. So, if you consider what the industrial base available uh, to you would be, if you chose to pursue your power via an on-orbit system, it would take about 40 years to build a grid on orbit with some useful spare capacity. That enables a lot of growth, so your global GDP is going to be around six to eight hundred trillion, and that means that you could have a curiosity budget worldwide of ten trillion, but that's not anywhere near as important as what the global energy market is going to be at that time. Now, what that enables at that time frame is that you're going to have 10 gigawatts of power in 5 gigawatt packages that is standard with the, with the largest thing being built of about 30,000 metric tons, somewhere around 10 kilometers in scale with 1 kilometer apertures. So that's kind of like what you can start off with. So what does that mean? Well, on the larger end, this means megatons of annual lift capacity. So if you're talking about a pulse fusion spacecraft, um, that's something that you could orbit in terms of mass in about a week, in terms of this, this infrastructure that we're talking about. In some cases, a day, but somewhere on the neighborhood of a week. Now, if you want to do a world ship, it's more challenging. It'd be like 400 years to orbit that, but that wouldn't be the way you could do it. You could self-deploy. 10 megawatts of industrial power to a near-Earth asteroid to build it in situ with about 400 metric tons of payload to start. So those of you interested in world ships, this is why you should like SSP. Those of you interested in Icarus Daedalus type of uh, stuff, that's the kind of infrastructure we could give you for free on consumer demand. So then on the low end, just having a 5 gigawatt solar power satellite could enable these classes of missions. A 1 gram payload at about 5 C, 124 gram payload at 1 C, 10 kilogram payload at about half a C. And if you can go a little bit more than that, then you're talking about the ability to go 10% C at about 1 gram a wafer. So then the other track that was focused on this, they came up with a particular plan uh, that I'll get to after this slide. 
But this group said, okay, so if we really wanted to do this, and we wanted to be ambitious with the previous goal of America's Quad Centennial, what would that look like? So if you say, I want to be on July 4th, 2176, I want to be getting the pictures back from a star that can be up to 10 light years away, that, and then that means that it has to arrive in 2166, and that means that we have to be ready to send in 2066, which in our timeline for space solar power is totally tractable. Because we'll have built the grid by around 2046, which means that if we want to start this, we have to convince a president that this is what they want to go do absolutely no later than November of 2028. So that gives us some time between now and then, but obviously if we can sell it early, uh, all the better. So, you know, we're having dinner with the president, we want to commit ourselves to be the first society to reach another star in a human lifetime. And reach it, we mean by image it, send back something. So the beam power was looking at, hey, what would be cool on the way to do that that would prove out the technology that we would need to get there? And so the, the really exciting thing they said is in 2045, we could be sending streams of these wafer sats at 0.3 C, point 0.3% C, which is 10 times faster than anything else human built, out to map our magnetosphere to the Kuiper Belt objects and Planet 9. And then before that, we could be testing smaller, slower at, uh, at 2035. And we only need about a 10 megawatt beamer to, to do this ambitious goal as the precursor to, to, uh, to going interstellar. So that basically, in summary, is, you know, what was the discussion of this working group? We do have time for a couple of questions. We are going to allot up to 10 minutes per group. So if there's a question or two for each of this group, let's Yes. Kennedy, at game 10 years, we're, we're giving 50 years between now and the launch date of the probe. Any questions? Got one over here. You wouldn't mind it happening sooner, would you? We would not mind it happening sooner. That, that's the no later than date. Beat. So this is the standard to beat. All right, very good. Thank you. Considering that Homo Stellaris is a question of what our society is going to become, we have a society presentation. Uh, the charge with the Homo Stellaris working track was to predict uh, some of the changes humanity will undergo or have to undergo uh, in the process of preparing for interstellar exploration or colon and or colonization and determine what some of these changes may be, what might be desirable, uh, and to start taking a look at how or what we can do to start bringing about those charges. Now, uh, ultimately we divided the panel, the working group, into three areas, a synergy group that's looking at big picture, broad view, uh, and then two subgroups that are looking at biological issues and sociological issues. And so I'm actually going to have the uh, deputies and uh, individuals who facilitated each of those subsections uh, come up and talk, and I will step to the side here. Morning. Well, not anymore. Um, it just feels that way. So, at any rate, uh, the thing, a couple of things I want to say for uh, hopefully the entirety of the group, which is they were, it, it was such a great group to work with. Um, it's unfortunate that they're not all up here to present their ideas because we had so many ideas. You are seeing but a fraction. This is a very, very small tip of an iceberg, wave tops only. Um, you're going to see something on here, which is you're going to see a bunch of sliding scales. That, to some degree, em embraces and recognizes the issue that we didn't want to get ourselves narrowed down to an extremely precise mission profile. We wanted to give ourselves essentially a little bit of, uh, a little bit of bandwidth and then sort of see what the, the, the consequences were as we moved back and forth inside that. And uh, now I have a weapon. Okay. So, um, uh, and so in going back and forth, the paradigms and the ranges of possibility arose actually as a sort of constant iterative recycling process with those two groups because we started with some assumptions. We, the, the group sort of fed back on those. We, the Synergy group, went and visited them again, and it bounced back and forth. And this is some of the stuff we came up with. Um, this, is, this drives everything. There was a need to start from a space-based society. 
until you have this, a lot of these things are essentially sort of one-offs and have a whole bunch of problems. When you get right down to it, the basic principle that this gives us is not only are the tech, many of the baseline technologies that you require already going to have been worked out in, in, in whole or in part, um, and you'll at least have an idea, a very clear idea of what you need to achieve, but the social aspects will also. Right now, we've never seen what even the smallest community looks like in the kind of isolation and environment that would be involved in a space faring culture in a system. Well, once you have one, you actually have proof of concept. Many of the things that we don't know about by this time, we have either knowledge about or a good idea about. So the multi-generational uh, problem here, we saw world ships were not necessarily practical. I think that's the nicest way to put it in a 100 to 150 year time frame. A lot because of exactly those sort of social proof of concept issues. Um, we, this gives us, as, as I said, a chance to test all the technologies and also the durations. You know, we will, we're looking, hope, we're, when, to say you have a space-based culture doesn't mean, okay, well, we've got eight people who've been living here for two years. Yes, we have a space-based culture. No, this is, this is self-sustaining communities that evolve organically, so you're not imposing social programming in the same way that you have to essentially develop technology. Uh, the mission need drives the bio and social need. You're going to see that in a second. Uh, the, some, of the, some of the mission ideas we basically had was that we would start with a scaled model, which is a robotic probe that deposits caches, and I shouldn't say deposit merely, but essentially a trajectory that will mimic and at the right speed so that the outgoing follow-up mission can actually make a very, very low or no delta V rendezvous with that, take on replenishment, continue on the way without having to sort of break and stop and break and stop. Um, it also is providing us caches at navigational waypoints. So some of the things it could be doing is surveying particle density in different areas where, for instance, are navigational hazards more likely or not. Anything from essentially uh, loose, you know, uh, monatomic hydrogen all the way down to, to, to junk. Um, and target systems that we looked at, and this is where you see some of the sliding scales. We assume a minimum of 0.01c propulsion, or a lot of these have to be revisited. And uh, if you can scale this up, you can go perhaps to that limit. But we would, the, naturally what we would prefer is the highest possible value here and the shortest possible distance there. And uh, we're seeing a crew of any place between 60 and 100 people. One of the things we felt was very important, um, as you'll, and you'll see how certain aspects in the biological component will come into this later, we felt that you should be, you should be crewing 5 to 15 people awake one year at a time with overlapping crews. So let's say four watches or more, so that you always have ongoing institutional knowledge that is being passed on to the next group. They overlap for a period of time. Group one goes back to sleep, we'll talk about that later, and then the next, and then becomes, if you will, the training group for the next. And that was sort of the, uh, the whole synergy we got to, and uh, let me give it, a, I think, to now the sociology here. Here's your weapon. Yeah. All right, so again, we want to get this idea where we're building a space-based society. Nothing, nothing succeeds like success for spawning the imagination. You know, start with the basics, something that's successful in space, a successful private enterprise. That's going to help feed enthusiasm. That's going to help bolster educational efforts to get more people out there. Um, there are potential, however, for worse cultural barriers if we do get this space-based society, just because you're going to have extreme isolation events. You know, if you're out on the asteroid belt and everyone else is back on Earth, there are going to be very weird and very different cultural things that happen. Um, so to help alleviate some of this, we want aggressive travel and study abroad cultural exchange programs. You know, ha have them do uh, final education on Earth or have them do their apprenticeship out on the belt so that you do get this constant uh, turnover, you do get this constant exchange so that no one becomes too isolated. So that we don't start seeing people who live out on the asteroid belt as aliens that look exactly like us but don't behave in any re uh, recognizable way. Um, again, feeding into the system-wide media and communications to, again, help feed in some of this. Yeah, you're going to end up with people who create their own echo chambers based on what they watch and, watch and, and what they follow, but it's going to help be an underlying uh, tie-in uh, to help keep some of the barriers down. And it's probably not at first going to be a commercial venture uh, in the long term. You're going to get the government sending people out and then it's something they're going to say, hey, look, this can be a profitable venture. And then you're going to get a lot of your corporations saying, yes, we can make money on this, do combines or something like this, and um, have more attempts at it. Um, some bioengineering may prevent participation. 
There are going to be societal groups that are going to be adamantly against it. No matter how you present it, no matter what you say, they're going to say, no, this is not for us. We are not going to choose this. Um, selectable bioengineering to retain migration capabilities and voluntary participation. Well, you know, what happens if you adapt someone for the asteroid belt and you can turn it off so that they can come back to Earth without any del deleterious effects? so that you can have these exchanges going back and forth, so that you don't have to have someone from the asteroid belt or wherever having to be in a hamster ball on Earth to protect them, or an Earther having to be in a hamster ball out on wherever. <laughs> um, and again, voluntary participation. Don't make it a mandate. Say, hey, if this is what you want to do, go ahead and do it. And then who goes and who enforces? And on to the next. Uh, okay, so the biological issues um, in the next 100, 150 years, we're not we're going to see a lot of changes kind of to us um, that we can do in medicine. Uh, but kind of for the concept of what we were looking at with the smaller ship, you want to do the initial small crew proof of life. You don't want to throw a whole bunch of people out into space and then have 10,000 people die. Uh, that would be a major disaster. Um, you need we need to develop stasis or hibernation capabilities. Uh, we see some trends in that right now uh, with some of the surgeries that uh, we're doing currently uh, with some uh, hypothermic uh, um, therapies that are in use. Um, we were looking at this with it being uh, an exploratory vessel uh, with a small crew. You need to be able to get the single lifespan. So we're looking at how to enhance longevity. There are some treatments out there or some therapies that are probably coming down the pipeline in the next, um, next couple of decades that's really going to uh, help us with that. Um, we need to stress the external or external assistive devices and limited modification over extensive bioengineering. Uh, what we're looking at is using technology to help us interface with the ship. Um, and then light modification, like the longevity, uh, like prosthesis, uh, prosthesis and that kind of thing that can help us. But we're not looking at trying to radically change the uh, human as we know it in the next 100 to 150 years. Uh, dirty colonists for immune robustness, that's really important. Uh, if you're going to put people into a sealed environment over time, um, when they get to the other side and they you know, come, come out of hibernation or whatever, and they all drop dead from the flu, that would not be, uh, that wouldn't be good. So what we're looking at is instead of trying to create an ultra sterile astronaut that you're putting into an enclosed environment, you're basically taking the man off the street who's the volunteer, and you're putting him in the spaceship with everything that comes with that. Uh, so we need to boost the immune system. And we also look from the biological aspect, we need multiple missions to protect against accidents and mortality. So moving forward, the key thing that came out of the entire discussion, and I want to thank everybody who participated. It's been a wonderful track, wonderful experience. Moving forward, the number, thing, number one thing we found is that we have to develop the space culture before we can understand the space culture. We're going to need to understand the space culture in order to take it further out. But we're going to have to develop it, and we're going to have to make mistakes. That's actually one of the key things that came out of it. It's going to be very risky. We're going to make mistakes. There's going to be failures. There's going to be successes. And really, if we're going to send somebody 20 light years out, we need to know that everything's going to work. And that's why we've got to get out there and start doing it. Thank you. OK, I think we'll, th this group ran a little long, but we can allow for at least one question if there is one, if anybody has one for them. I've got one. Did your group at all, um, speaking of ac biological accidents, cover biological happy accidents at all? Uh, we, we talked a lot about mutations and uh, engineering pros and cons a lot. Yes, we did talk about some happy accidents. Are you talking about procreation? Yeah. yeah. One of the aspects is, in fact, that we want to, we would want to send a crew out and encourage them to procreate. Because that's a reward. At, at the end. At mission completion. At the end. 
At the end. Once you get there, they have the stuff necessary to start the outpost. You have your colony, your follow-on colony ships, the proof of concept. Sorry. Uh, so at the end of this thing, you, you have everything necessary to at least start your outpost and start your colony, um, and then your follow-on populations come afterwards. But you don't want them procreating while they're on their way there, because now you're adding to the consumables that... Yep. All right, very good. We're, this, is, this is great. Uh, but I'd like to call up the Life System Engineering in the World Ship group, led by Cassidy Cobbs and Michelle LeBontaine. So we're life systems engineering on uh, world ships, and um, we actually came out of the last TVIW. Here, you want to hold up this? One of Michelle's lovely posters. That's one of the rings of our ship. So last TVIW, our track, um, our track worked to sort of do a preliminary design of of what a world ship would look like, and and this is essentially what we came up with, and we we um, wrote it up for Jabez. Um, and so this year we wanted to focus on um, the, the, the life systems in particular, the, the ecology and the cycling and that kind of thing um, on the ship. So to that end, we, we um, spent yesterday uh, split into two groups, the biotic group and the abiotic group, and we, um, we, spent, we spent time uh, just asking questions. So coming up with everything we could think of that we didn't know about how life would work on a world ship. There are a lot of those questions. Uh, and <laughs> just pointing at the slide. Yes, that's a, oh, you want me to turn the lights off? And we had um, a really awesome group. Actually, if everybody from, from world ship could stand up, say hi. Yeah, there, there we go. Yeah, yeah, we're awesome. Um, and then today we, 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 we decided on three sort of primary problems and um, we put some actual um, calculation in and hopefully came up with a couple concrete answers about those systems in particular. So Michelle is going to start. Okay, so uh, can we, how do we advance the slides? Okay, thanks. So the first, one of the three, tra three items we went through was heat transfer to ensure comfortable life, set the parameters, and uh, think a bit of how we would put everybody within, uh, inside of our, uh, our large tin can. So uh, the, par the basic parameters we started with were developed over the last year for the, the JBS paper, of course, and also for work that was done with Chris Welsh and uh, the International uh, Space uh, University. And we're basically, and I'm with Icarus, so we're basically all three from the world track have started working on this thing in common. And this, will, this is how it's moving forward to a second track that we did and eventually to other elements. So, uh, 500, uh, 5 kilometers in diameter. So the habitat from the middle to the side, we have a central core, which we haven't designed yet. We have a ceiling, which we haven't designed yet, but which we do know will be at the proper thickness so that internal pressure will balance centrifugal force and overall, there won't be any strain on it, so it could be very light. Then we have a 500 meter layer of habitat where all the good stuff happens. And under the, the habitat, we want to keep between 8 and 38 with variation, so it isn't too horribly boring. Uh, a standard atmospheric pressure. We're doing a world ship, we're recreating the world. This is the first order model, the model, the base model. After that, all kinds of variations are possible depending on the need, where we want to go. But we start by making the Earth. Uh, so 100 kPa, an average solar illumination, the sun, simulated sun, is our power source at 240 watts per meter square. 
and equivalent day, night, and all of the variations. Under that, we'll have uh, five meters of soil, perhaps, on average. Then a shell, a tenson shell that carries the soil. Then a water shield, come ocean, combined with an ocean, or separated, depending on biological analysis. Then an outer shell, structural shell that holds everything in. The whole thing is fired to kilometers in diameter. There are unknowns, as we said, the ceiling, the materials. Shall we have a central light with a transparent ceiling? Or shall we have rotating lights, because this is a course? Or shall we have turning off, turning on lights on a 24-hour cycle with a kind of dawn going all around it in 24 hours? There are many possibilities. And we're not stopping here. We can go on analyzing this in the, in the, next, uh, uh, in the next months and years. Next slide. Ah, that's me. <laughs> okay, so uh, the thermodynamic analysis question that this raised. So we have, a mo we have a physical model. In this model, there are power and energy transportation questions. So we have a 500 meter habitat, as we, as, as we all mentioned, the ground shell. So we have energy coming in, we have energy going out. We might, we want to define a variable emissivity, a system that varies the emissivity so that the power that goes out can vary. So we can vary the temperature according to this variable emissivity and uh, create heat flux around the ship to create weather and create inter interesting patterns. We also want to study, we would like to know, if these variations are enough to create rain. And this is not known. We might have to have sprinkler equivalents. But as a piping engineer, I know that pipes get blocked. And over a thousand years, they'll get blocked very, 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 very many times. So we'd rather have a working cycle. So we want to design this right away, something that works on its own, put in power, it works, nothing gets blocked. That's what we'll be working on in the future on this aspect of the thing. And then we go on to the next step, which is actual life. So our uh, second group problem was that of um life system cycles. So the second group worked on uh, some of the major cycles uh, that we would need to replicate on the ship, carbon dioxide and oxygen cycling, nitrogen cycling, and phosphorus cycling. So they identified a, a framework uh, to explore how to recreate these cycles, um, starting with identifying the individual primary non-overlapping cycle uh, networks and pathways. And um, there's an example of the phosphorus cycle down here. It's not really legible, but you get the idea. Um, then to, to get a gross approximation of the static compositions of all of the uh, individual uh, contributions to the cycle. So here's sort of like um, nitrogen, the, what's the abundance in, in plant life on average? What are the sources and sinks? Um, and that's going to vary by, by biome and by plant and animal. Um, then to start to look at the recycle and um, recycling and rates uh, for cycling within the networks between um, different systems. And after that, you can get into um, identifying the actual considerations. So, so how fast are the plants growing or, or the animals growing? How much do they eat? Because all of that feeds into, um, you know, if the plants grow faster, they might use more phosphorus. You need to make sure there's more in the soil. Um, and so. That's, that's a diagram that I think was just put in there because it's really complicated. <laughs> uh, and so um, we actually have sort of a, a spreadsheet framework already set up where we can start putting in um, the gross estimates of things and getting out you know, um, the ship values that we're going to need for each of those elements. Um, and this is obviously work that will continue um, as we go. So um, I think this is a really... Uh, I think that's the last slide, but I think that's a um, really good step in uh, identifying the major components of the cycling. And then our third question was about the uh, agriculture. 
on board the ship. So there were two concerns there. Obviously, first, we want to decide what kind of agriculture is important to take along. We also need to estimate the um, relative land use. So we need to figure out how much space we need to devote to crops and, and, and animals. So in, in identifying livestock species, we were looking for food, fiber, and fertilizer. So what are some of the more efficient species we can take for that? For crops, we were looking primarily for sustainability, then crops with high cultural significance, and then we want variety. It's a long voyage. So we made a list. <laughs> so you can see some of the things we liked, and I'll leave that up. Um, and then we're looking for information on, um, this is what we're continuing to work on. We started, we started this, we started a spreadsheet, um, and we'll continue to work on filling in the, the soil and climate requirements, the growth seasons, and then figuring out what type of crop rotations we might do. Um, and we also created a frivolous list of things that are and are not coming on the world show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it for one question if there is a question for this group. We'll take one. I don't know who has the roaming mic, so... Uh, oh, okay, good. In a quick look there, what I, I see is a whole lot of herbivores. Are there no carnivores? Um, In which well, case, how do you, how do you build an ecosystem? Yeah, how you build an ecosystem is an excellent question uh, that we're going to have to start answering really soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the conference is over, you know. <laughs> As a society. Um, these are just livestock. Uh, yes, we plan on bringing carnivores, probably small ones, weasels and cats rather than lions and bears. And, and by the way, uh, the intent of these tracks, if we're successful, is there's going to be some kind of a written report that comes out of this, some of which might be published. So uh, stay tuned, and we will be having uh, everyone who attended here kept up to date on the progress of all the work that's happened in these tracks. So very good. Thank, that, thank you to group. Now the uh, final group is uh, going to present, and this is the uh, proton beam reduction primary extraction from genetic uh, generic Asteroid material, so I'll give you Eric Hughes, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Okay, matters. Come on. Hello. I'd like to start out by talking about the scope of what we are working on when we got together into our working group. We are trying to look at uh, processing silicates that are known to be available in space, starting with abundant minerals to produce. Um, space-based solar power, and the key material for that is silicon. So we want to look at, in detail, how you would get high-purity silicon out of, um, out of native material that's actually available and that hasn't undergone geochemical weathering like on Earth. Now, Eric will talk later about how they kind of had a really radical, revolutionary approach that gets you a lot of interesting side effects um, along with silicon. <laughs> and the group that uh, I worked with we tried to do a more evolutionary approach that's based on techniques known to work on Earth, based on industrial practice, and um, iterated and adapted for the space environment. So unlike a lot of ISRU uh, programs, we didn't start out trying to look at how we could build everything that you'd need for a space-based solar power system, or for um, a colony, or for um, you know, mining machinery. Even though we're ultimately going to need all of those things, we wanted to stick to uh, one fairly narrow area of focus and go deep. And Eric managed to go wide, too. But it's a really interesting way he went wide. Um, I think we should start with the radical approach. So here's Eric. It still disintegrates things. <laughs> no plan survives contact with work track working track participants. So we ended up not really getting anything that we had initially intended to do on our half. We ended up designing the machine better. But one of, so there are some pieces of the machine we'd have to draw diagrams and do physics, but we can talk about longitudinal velocity distribution and plasma beams. 
I don't want to do that. That's not the subject of a five-minute work report. The main thing we found out, which is, I think, the important takeaway as a whole, is that this particular industrial ecology system is highly, highly dependent, even just to do mass estimates, which look like they might be fairly simple, and you can wave your hands and kind of say, this belongs here. That doesn't even work. You really need to know what your applications are, what your raw materials are. All of the industrial ecology it's part of is really, really necessary in order to figure out how to engineer these things. It, it, this, was a, this, this was much more dependent on material availability and end use than I had anticipated when we started doing this track. So that's, that should be a cautionary note that a bunch of hand waving about things that you can manufacture in space should not be taken lightly. This is, I, I already thought it was difficult and I underestimated for, for doing this working track. So what we found out very specifically about my machine is that there were, there were things about the output products that had to be better characterized in terms of how they were used, in terms of what purity you need. Because if you don't get adequate separation, the, you might have to do multi-passes, and that affects the energy multipliers, and it affects the total masses. I mean, there's just lots and lots of these interacting things. So we need to know what, these, what the missions are of these things in order to better characterize them. So what I would recommend for the community is to develop some standard scenarios of use so that we can mark apples to apples when we're doing estimates. Now, it's not to say that these scenarios will be the ones that are doing. You want canonical scenarios so that you can make estimates that can be compared against each other. And then you design the actual mission. You don't use your reference designs to, for, for planning. You use them for comparison. Thanks, Eric. So Eric talked about a sort of reference scenario. We did have uh, both of our tracks did have sort of a reference scenario that we are targeting, which is producing uh, 1,000 tons of high purity silicon per year in the form of silane gas, which is a direct manufacturing input to the manufacture of um, radiation tolerant thin film solar systems that you can, uh, you can use in low earth orbit or in geosynchronous or really anywhere in the solar system. Good uh, specific power, high power to mass ratio and manufactured only from materials that we can find out there, although we allow ourselves to bring some materials along to uh, do intermediate processing. So the track that I was on, we did two, uh, we did two chemical engineering based scenarios. The first day, we, we first of all switched our working material, our input from olivine to enstatite, which is a simple magnesium silicate, just magnesium, oxygen, and uh, uh, silicon as the main materials in it, um, thanks to Dr. John Lewis for making that uh, improvement to our process. And then we looked at, first of all, a very terrestrially based um, scenario based around transformations with um, chlorine as our working halogen and just basically closing the loop on elements we need to recycle, but otherwise trying to stick as closely as possible to the industrial practice that we know already works on Earth. And then the second day, we looked at um, an older scenario for uh, actually lunar material processing published by uh, Robert, Robert Waldron back in the late 70s. And he was looking at using a hydrofluoric acid approach to basically digest any old chunk of lunar surface you came across and separate all the elements out. So that was exciting, but we had a narrower scope because we only had one relatively well-characterized mineral to do. And what we actually did today was we were able to develop um, mass estimates for all of our inputs, outputs, and uh, intermediate materials that you would need to do this thousand tons of, of high-purity silicon per year, oh. characterize the chemical reactions we'd need. And now, you know, my follow-up oh. work after this is going to be going back to um, the wiki that we started developing collaboratively before we even showed up here. We're going, to take, uh, we're going to take Waldron's scenario and see what pieces we can borrow to narrow it down to this scope of silicon and then widen out again because we want to go deep, not wide to begin with. But as Eric said, we need a whole industrial ecology around this. So we want to, we want to take this as our central starting point and branch out iteratively, sort of the way we did when we were working um, together in these working tracks here at TVIW. Thank you. Questions. Jeff Landis has his hand up in the back. Uh, 
Yeah, I've been looking at making uh, silk and solar cells on the moon for a while, so I have some background. But I'll just press back a little bit on your suggestion that silane is the source material for making high efficiency, radiation tolerant, high power to weight uh, solar cells, because uh, in fact, silk and solar cells are none of those things. Uh, the high efficiency, high radiation tolerant, high power to weight solar cells uh, are all basically gallium arsenide based materials uh, at the moment. The one just superb advantage of silicon uh, is that it's an abundant material. So it's something that you can make decent solar cells out of, uh, but don't expect them to be necessarily high, high power to weight or radiation tolerant. But with that said, probably what's more important for you to make uh, is high transparency glass, uh, because the glass is where the weight is. I, I would actually uh, disagree to an extent with your disagreement. I would agree everything that you said just uh, just now applies to crystalline silicon solar cells. Amorphous silicon cells are highly radiation tolerant, comparable, uh, comparable to cadmium telluride or uh, copper, indium, gallium, diselenide. They are low efficiency but high specific power if you manufacture them in space because they don't have to be tolerant of mechanical stresses the way ones on Earth's surface do. And actually, our, um, a material that didn't really come up in the scope of space extraction but that we know we need right now or are going to need to replace is actually indium, not for actually making compound sem semiconductors, but right now uh, this is a commonly used as a material for transparent conductive oxide layer. And it just re needs an outrageous amount for our target amount. We need we consume about a third of Earth's production per year if we went this route. So we know that needs to be replaced. And there are some options out there, but none of them are really uh, high TRL. Yeah, the efficiency of amorphous silicon is just so low that they never end up being. Yeah. The efficiency of amorphous silicon thin film cells ends up just being so low that they're never the right solution for whatever you do. Uh, because the solar cells themselves are not necessarily even the largest component of the weight of the system. So if you have a low efficiency array that you're trying to make very large, uh, you just almost never win by, by making it a, a low efficiency lightweight material. You almost always win by making it a higher efficiency, uh, a higher efficiency material. Again, I would agree for terrestrial use. One last question from someone else and then we have Thank <laughs> you.